Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And this video is a continuation of the previous one where I was discussing the, the uh, stratospheric polar vortex and also discussing Rossby waves in the troposphere or jet streams and how they affect extreme weather events and the interaction the pulling and pushing between the stratosphere and the troposphere. Most people don't know too much about the stratosphere. All the weather happens in the troposphere. The tropopause is the dividing line between the troposphere where the weather occurs and the stratosphere. Most people know that the ozone's up in the stratosphere and is vital for life on the planet. So if we go to a pressure, as you go away from the surface, the, about a, where the pressure is about a thousand millibar or a thousand hexapascals. As you go up higher and higher, the pressure drops because gravity is pulling the air closer to the surface of the Earth. You go right up to the stratospheric polar vortex, which is at 10 millibar pressure. And if you're at 250 millibar pressure, you have the, the tropospheric polar vortex, it, but it's more commonly known as jet streams or Rossby waves. And you can see these ridges and these troughs. The cold air goes down into the troughs, the warm, humid air goes up into the ridges. As the, as the Arctic warms like crazy, the temperature increases. So the equator is always about a fixed temperature, much warmer. As the Arctic's warming, the temperature gradient decreases. This jet stream slows down, becomes wavier. You get it to stuck and you get extreme weather events. Earth Null School is a great resource. So uh, you can click the pressure levels here. We're looking at the in the air at winds. This is 10 hexapascals. So this is a polar vortex, okay? And it's actually split. There's a little, little sub vortex here. So it's basically bimodal or split in this case, but most of the energy is in this main mode. So what's important is if it's split or if it's one, um, entity, um, how elliptical it is, how elongated it is. Right now it's more like a football. Is it, it can squish up and become more like a soccer ball. And you can look at the center and see how that's displaced. The North Pole is here. When it's displaced, the cold air can shift also. And it pulls up, because it's rotating this way, it pulls up the tropopause underneath. Um, if you go to 250 millibar, this is the jet streams that you can see. Okay, so cold air is going down into the troughs, warm air is coming up into the ridges. So this will be warm, humid air. This will be much colder, um, dry air. Okay, so those are the key uh, points. And I was showing you that when meteorologists started using the term polar vortex, they were describing this cold event, this cold outbreak in North America in January. So this is January 3rd up to the 8th. The white outline is the polar vortex in the stratosphere at 10 millibar. The black line is the, the jet streams or the Rossby waves. This is a ridge here, so the warm air is coming up. So what you can look is you can see that over these days, you got a very sharp trough here over North America. Cold air came down, and that was described as the polar vortex. Okay, but remember this is the polar vortex at in the stratosphere, and this is the one in the troposphere, but it's more commonly the Rossby waves. So there's a ridge here, warm air is coming up, a trough here, cold air is coming down. So you can see how this, how the rotation and the shape is changing of both of those um, vortices. And there's some, there's lots of other details in this paper. Okay, what is the polar vortex and how does it influence weather? If you just Google that, you can read the article. There's lots of good information and details that you can get out of that. Now, Google Scholar is a very useful thing for finding papers. You can access a lot of the original scientific papers, um, not the most recent ones for from, from mo a lot of journals, unless they're open source, but you can always look for them. So if you Google Google Scholar, click on it. We're in Google Scholar. I picked since 2017 here, and I'm looking at stratospheric, stratosphere vortex displacement and splitting 
and then how it relates to the troposphere. And this is what I get with my search. You can click on these. You can always read the abstract or the short summary at the beginning of these papers to describe what, what is in them. And if the papers are older, you can read the whole article or you can go to a local library or a university library and ask somebody there, say you need to access a paper and you can actually access it that way because the libraries have subscriptions um, to these papers. Okay, so this is one, this is a good paper, the influence of stratospheric vortex displacement and splits on surface climate from 2012. So basically it talks about the strong link between the stratospheric variability and anomalous weather patterns at the Earth's surface. Okay, so we have these, normally the Arctic polar vortex is spinning around quite nicely, reasonable strength. Occasionally we can get what's called a sudden stratospheric warming or, and that will weaken the polar vortex. And then when it weakens, then there's anomalies can descend from the upper stratosphere to the surface on time scales of weeks. And then you can get the, so it weakens this polar vortex in the stratosphere and you get cold air events coming down. So you get cold air spilling out of the Arctic, going over, for example, North America, like we've seen, you know, all that cold air from the Arctic spilling into North America, it means that Europe is a lot warmer, for example. Or you can get this quadrupole pattern, which is a four pattern system on the surface in terms of pressures, but it's not really understood. This is, you know, there's a lot of complication in this, and I don't want to go into them. There's a lot of things that we're learning because people haven't studied the stratosphere too much. Um, but you can get these blocking events in the jet streams, and they can be associated with certain patterns in the polar vortex. And then the polar vortex changes could then amplify the blocking patterns. And so you get a feedback sort of thing and it becomes a sort of a chicken and the egg problem. So let's just have a look at some of these papers. So polar stratospheric variability is largely dominated by vertically propagating Rossby waves of tropospheric origin. Okay, so we normally think of the jet streams as moving parallel to the surface, right? They're moving at a certain altitude above the surface and they're moving, they're circumventing the earth. But what happens is when these uh, high speed winds, they can be influenced by ridges and by, by topography, for example, by the temperature contrast between the ocean and the land. Um, okay, so topography, mountains and things like that. For example, you know, as, if the jet streams reach a certain location over India and then near the Tibetan plateau, then they can be pushed vertically, not completely vertically, but they're mostly running west to east. They can get a vertical component and go right up into the stratosphere, travel up to the Arctic and come down, split the polar vortex and cause these outbreaks of cold air in the Arctic. So these things are all connected. Okay, so vertical movement of the Rossby waves, and that would happen mostly in the Northern Hemisphere because there's topography changes and there's land ocean contrast as opposed to in the southern hemisphere. Um, so you get these different things. You can have major or minor strat sudden stratospheric warmings, splitting the vortex, the polar vortex, and then uh, feeding back and getting causing outbreaks and things. So I'm not going to go into the math and the details, but here's events that are that are outlined. So this is a summary of weak vortex events, okay? Events are either a displacement, so that means the polar vortex in the stratosphere is displacing away from the North Pole, the centroid is shifting, or it can split into two, into two uh, vortices, or it can be a mixture of the both. So these are different events. So this is displacement to the D, as is the splitting, and you can have a combination of events. And so they're all itemized, they're all being studied, and, uh, and graphed and the statistics of them is looked at. And this is an example, for example. So here's the polar vortex here, nice and symmetric, almost circular. Okay, here's where it starts to break up. Part of it is being left behind. So this is the onset of, of the displacement in this case. This is the onset two days later. Okay, it's almost like a, like a tadpole. Here's another, another two days later, another two days later, 
and then this part here weakens and you end up with a polar vortex that is displaced okay that is displaced down so you have very very cold very stormy conditions under here and you'd have it very cold on the east coast of north america and in europe if this displacement happens down to north america then we get north america locked into a very cold um, situation it's like opening the refrigerator door of the arctic and here's an example of these are and these are examples these are splitting events here mostly happening in january and february the the uh, squares these are displacement events here mostly happening in march and then these are uh, both events the triangles mixed happening you know uh, mostly in the uh, december time frame and again i can just i can't cover all of the details um so i think i'll okay so there's a lot of information in these papers you can find it yourself this is an interesting thing about connecting polar vortex events to blockings okay so if you get a blocking in the stratus in the troposphere this is so this is the rosby waves this is the jet streams you get a very um intense um ridge towards the towards the uh, pole and then you get a, a trough a strong trough so this is and it becomes persistent and fixed in place this is like a blocking event then you can get vertical movement of the air you can get a sudden stratospheric warming and that splits the polar vortex in the stratosphere and that feeds back and can intensify the ridges and troughs in the lower atmosphere and therefore cause more and more extreme weather events so i'm just uh, saying that there's lots of connections um and there's lots of here's a uh, very strong vortex event so the polar vortex is very very strong in the stratosphere this is a central date these are when it's very very weak so these are stratospheric warming dates and there's a lot more of them here and that can lead to either splitting of the vortex or displacement so the effect is very weak you know where it used to be it's moved it's moved uh, towards away from the pole so it's weaker at the pole and but it's stronger at lower latitudes where it can bring lots of cold air like over north america right now um, or at least in you know lots of this winter okay so there's the connections there and there's also work that's being done to link you know why are these things changing with climate change how is abrupt climate change affecting it and it all comes down to the albedo or reflectivity in the arctic so we're losing sea ice exponentially we're losing snow cover in the spring over the land the arctic is getting a lot darker it's absorbing a lot of solar radiation and one would think that that would completely not only does it uh, cause the rosby waves to slow down the jet streams to slow down and become wavier and then affect the polar vortex you know maybe it has some direct effects so this paper um, is just studying it and they didn't find that a, a big relationship between sea ice decline and the vortex location and strength um, i don't believe that they looked at snow cover and snow cover is actually declining at almost twice the rate that sea ice is declining which is pe which people always forget about okay so so those are the key things here so let's have a look just at how the polar vortex has changed over time so i go to 10 hexapascals and now just uh i'm going to retreat back a day so this is yesterday and just uh, retreat and you can see how the elongation is changing in the in the okay i'll just keep cycling back so look there's a lot more energy going into the second lobe so we can see what's happening to the jet streams and you get it when you get all these loops and whirls and all it's fractured up here you're probably looking at a situation where there's lots of energy not just at a central lobe but being split into a double lobe so i'm just going to cycle back more days and see what happened so here you can see it's very different and now there's more energy coming in here less coming in here okay so you can just cycle back and you can see that the 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 area here is is widening it's not as elongated it's becoming more circular let's just keep going okay there's more energy coming into this lobe so you can see how this varies and relate it to 
the Jets dream and just learn about